The news at noon starts right now. A man who was shot at a home in Southeast Bear County has now died. The Bear County Sheriff's Office is still investigating, but says the man was visiting the home near Loop 1604 and Highway 87 at the time. As Katrina Weber reports, they're still trying to determine who pulled the trigger and why. Yellow crime scene tape shows a home on DeBose Road is off limits. That's because a man who had visited people here earlier somehow was shot. Bear County Sheriff's deputies responded to a call from the subdivision near Loop 1604 and Highway 87 just before 11 last night. They say they were told there had been an argument in that home that escalated, resulting in the shooting. The man who the medical examiner identified as 24-year-old Josh Fowler was rushed to a hospital but died of his wounds later. According to deputies, there were other people in or around the home at the time. But those investigators weren't able to say how the shooting happened or who it was who pulled out the gun. Deputies did take several people from the house in for questioning, but as of late this morning, a spokesman told me that investigation is still going on, and he says so far no one has been arrested. Reporting from downtown, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. As our community continues dealing with the coronavirus crisis, we're seeing the seven day average rise in Bear County. It's now above the 1000 mark. It's currently standing at 1113. And during the latest briefing, we learned that nine more people have died after contracting the virus. Over in our hospitals, there are 646 COVID-19 patients, 220 are in the intensive care unit and 114 are on ventilators. In the midst of all of this, many live theaters and performances uh, uh, venues all across San Antonio have gone dark during the pandemic. This week's episode of KSAT Explains looks at how those venues are managing to survive. RJ Marquez has a preview and tells us about the push across the country to save our stages. It has been extremely difficult. We were shut down in the middle of March um, and uh, we furloughed a, a lot of our employees and we basically went dark. Aaron Zimmerman has been with the Tobin Center for Performing Arts since it opened in 2014. He's seen countless shows come through and he knows what the Tobin and its rich history means to the local arts and performance community. And this was the same site as the municipal auditorium and the people of San Antonio really have a lot of history and remember coming here, whether it was their high school graduation or whether, you know, it was Elvis or Jimi Hendrix. Like thousands of performance venues across the country, the pandemic forced the theater to shut off the lights. The Tobin didn't host any live performances for months. It has slowly reopened with strict social distancing guidelines. Still, they're struggling to get by. It's just really difficult to just make the numbers work and, and stay afloat with our capacity at about, uh, you know, 30 per, 25 or 30 percent of what we once operated at. In an effort to get these independently owned and nonprofit venues some much needed financial help, the Save Our Stages Act was introduced in the Senate back in July. It has support across the aisle, but its passing is now in question after the November election. That uncertainty has left many live local venues in limbo. Many of these venues need this money to survive or they could be shut down for good. It's scary and, it, and it's sad. I mean, uh, arts and music and theater and dance, uh, these are pillars of every community. These are things that you grow up uh, learning and that are important in, in the development of children. And frankly, they're important in having a release in life. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. KSAT explains Save Our Stages will be available to stream this Thursday. You'll be able to find it on our website at ksat.com slash explains. And of course, many people have questions, especially when it comes to the way that COVID-19 is affecting our local schools. And that's why the next topic in our series of live streams aims to get you some answers. Tonight, Steve Spreester and Isis Romero will be joined by experts from Trinity University. They're going to be discussing the impact of coronavirus and what it has on our education community. And they'll tackle some of the questions and concerns from you. So go to our website, kset.com, and let us know what you want answered. The live stream starts on our air at 630 this evening, and then it will continue on our website at 7 o'clock. And you can submit those questions for the virtual town hall, which is happening tomorrow as well. The topic of conversation then will be the coronavirus vaccine. Isis Romero, along with a panel of experts from San Antonio Metro Health and other health and government agencies, will answer your questions. That starts at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. 
The U.S. continuing to set grim records in the coronavirus pandemic with 213,000 new COVID-19 cases reported yesterday alone. But we do have some good news. Pfizer's vaccine is just a step away from emergency use authorization. As ABC's Rena Roy explains, a big meeting is scheduled tomorrow at the FDA to discuss whether it's safe for Americans to take. Coast to coast, more than 104,000 Americans are hospitalized with COVID-19, according to the COVID tracking project. And healthcare facilities are feeling the strain more so than ever this time around. This wave is worse, just one after another patient's coming in, so sick. The New York Times reports more than a third of Americans live in areas where hospitals are running critically short of ICU beds. Staffing is also a concern. Dr. Andrew Carroll had to fill surge shifts over the weekend at his Phoenix hospital. The ICU is full. The teams are working as hard as they can. We're trying to get in as many um, specialized personnel from out of state to help us out. We're running on empty here. State officials are buckling down with strict new orders to help stop the spread. California smashing its daily records for new cases and deaths, sending an emergency alert to millions, urging them to stay home, especially with numbers expected to rise even more post Thanksgiving. Thursday, a big day in the race for a vaccine. An FDA advisory committee will meet to discuss whether Pfizer's vaccine should be given emergency use authorization. In its first analysis, the FDA says the vaccine appears 95 percent effective for all Americans older than 16, no matter race, ethnicity or gender. It's already being administered in the UK and officials are optimistic the same will happen here in the US with Americans possibly getting vaccinated as early as this week. Within 24 hours of that approval, uh, we will begin moving the vaccines. From there, states will begin distribution. Some like Colorado doing test runs with mock vials to test how to efficiently travel with those doses in ultra cold freezers. Experts say the vaccine itself won't curb cases likely until spring of next year, so they're urging people to keep social distancing and wearing masks to help save lives. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Meantime, after the first day of vaccinations in England, a precautionary warning for those who tend to have allergic reactions. Britain's medical regulator warning that people with a history of serious allergy reactions should not receive the COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer. This after two people suffered reactions on the first day of the vaccination program there. Both recovered and the warning again just precautionary as they continue to investigate the cause of those reactions. Other top stories this noon, three years after a woman was shot and killed, San Antonio police are still working to solve the case. Now they are hoping someone will come forward with some useful information. Police tell us that back on December 2nd, 2017, a vehicle pulled up and someone from inside fired several shots into this car, killing Detranic Hawkins on Highway 281 and Stadium Drive. Investigators don't know who pulled the trigger. However, they do think they know what the suspect's vehicle looks like. They tell us it has dark tinted windows and it may still have damage to the right rear passenger door. If you have any information that could lead to an arrest, you're being asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. You may be eligible for a cash reward. Police say a driver walked away after being involved in a northwest side crash that left two people hurt. Now that man is facing charges. Eduardo Castillo Lopez has been charged with two counts of failure to stop and render aid. Investigators say he was driving in the 3700 block of Fredericksburg Road when he failed to yield and hit another vehicle. Police tell us after the crash, Lopez got out of his truck, looked inside the other vehicle, and then walked away from the scene. And I'll let you know what not one but two cold fronts mean for our weather over the next couple of days coming up in the full forecast. And also coming up this half hour, Des Bryant was looking forward to playing his old team, the Cowboys, and something happened on the way to the field, and he went Twitter happy. Larry Ramirez with what happened coming up in sports. If you've been on the fence about adopting a new pet, Animal Care Services has an offer you may not be able to refuse. We have details after the break. This SA Salutes Holiday Greeting is brought to you by Texas Med Clinic. On behalf of Texas Med Clinic at Highway 46 and Oakland Parkway here in New Braunfels, we want to wish you all a happy holiday. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.
If you happen to be in the market for a new furry friend, Animal Care Services is offering pet adoptions for reduced prices this holiday season. You can take home a dog for $25 and a cat for $15. The Empty the Shelters event starts today. It runs through December 13th. If you are interested, you'll need to make an appointment. Masks and social distancing are required on the ACS campus. And even though a new pet can make for a fun present, ACS wants people to remember the gift of responsibility along with that pet because owning a pet is a long-term commitment. Foster an environment of when you adopt a pet, a pet is family. Before adopting a pet, understanding that a pet is a lifelong commitment. To get started, go to the ACS page on the city's website. There you can make an appointment and take a look at some of the cats and dogs that are looking for their forever homes. During the pandemic, families in and around San Antonio are dealing with financial hardships, and that could mean a few less gifts under the Christmas tree. But as Max Massey shows us, SAPD's Blue Santa program is here to help thousands of local children this holiday season. All right, well, we are here at Blue Santa's secret workshop, and if you take a look over here, we can see some of Blue Santa's helpers putting together the gift bags ready to deliver to the kids here locally. Question is, why do you guys do this? Why is the passion here? Um, the passion is, I think it's always been here. This program started in 74, just by a group of officers. So we enjoy giving back to the community and giving back to the children. And to us, it's, it's about the children. And how many children are you helping out this year? Uh, well, we hope to go a little over 4,000. Right now, we're at 3,000 children already that we have already processed the bags for. Wow. And so for anyone watching right now, how can they help out? Well, honestly, we are accepting donations of any type. And uh, they can go to any substation nearest them and drop off the donations. Uh, we're accepting them uh, any time of the day up to uh, any after Christmas time. All right. Logistics-wise, how does this all work? Well, it's a process, of course. This is our workshop, and this is our assembly line. As you can see, officers come and assemble, and we make the blue Santa bags out of the applications that are received. After that, we go ahead and put these uh, bags in the unit where they're transported to each of the substations. At that time, the individual officers will take the bags and deliver them to the houses. All right, so it's Blue Santa going door to door. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And the SAPD Blue Santa Helpers has a special message out there for our community. Merry Christmas! Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Got to thank all those folks. They're working hard, and it's not real cool outside. Doesn't feel like Christmas. But, you know, you know. Yeah, everybody's wearing their Santa hats and uh, Santa sweaters, and uh, it's not necessary. And we're yeah, we're pushing 80 degrees already. Such a big. I mean, it was pretty chilly this morning, but we're going to see a huge swing in temperatures by later this afternoon, and a uh, couple of warm days before some cooler days ahead as we get closer to the weekend. We'll talk about that coming up. The aquifer is down nearly a foot in the past 24 hours to 661.2, but another good-looking pollen count mold is still our only allergen today, and it's low with a count of 150. We'll be right back. Pushing 80 degrees yeah. in December. We made snow today on the 9 o'clock show, Katie's Science Project. Yeah. And the snow we made is not like real snow, but it seemed like it was melting. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. At that hour, geez, I think it was still in the 50s, low 60s, and now we're already closer to 80 degrees. So big warm up is underway today. I do want to show you corrected aquifer level. What I had earlier had not been updated yet. The aquifer is down eight tenths of a foot today to 660.4. Mold is still low, but the count was a little off. Today's count is 240. So just wanted to make sure you had the correct info there. Here are our morning low temperatures today below freezing in parts of the hill country 41 at the airport. Here's where we're sitting right now. So it is already more than 30 degrees warmer than it was first thing this morning. 77 at the airport, 78 in Pleasanton, 76 in Kerrville this afternoon. Middle of the afternoon, four o'clock or so here is where our temperatures will be upper 70s, low 80s. We're going for 81 here in San Antonio and Bear County this afternoon. So yes, a huge swing in our temperatures today. Part of the reason for that is because our air is very dry. Our dew points are low anywhere from the teens up in the hill country to the 30s and 40s down a little bit closer to the Gulf of Mexico. Bottom line, very dry air. And when our air is this dry, it's very easy for it to cool off more overnight and then warm up easier during the day. So we've got the dry air 
we've got a lot of sunshine, so that will help to warm us up as well. And what's happening in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere, we're sitting under a ridge of high pressure. Typically, that does spell sunny and warm conditions. That's exactly what we're looking at today. So here is that ridge of high pressure over Texas. As we get into the day tomorrow and Friday, that ridge will move down into the Gulf of Mexico. Make room for an upper level disturbance to move in from the west. This will prompt higher moisture for us here. We'll get the humidity to build back in as we get into Friday and also a chance of some showers on Friday as a little frontal boundary comes on through Saturday. Pretty quiet weather, but then another disturbance passing by on Sunday will offer another chance of rain and yet another frontal boundary to move through. So we'll have a little back and forth over the next few days. Warm and sunny today, but we will see some changes as we get into the weekend. As far as those rain chances go Friday and then again on Sunday, Nothing to write home about. I do think Friday will end up being a pretty damp day because along with the chance of isolated showers, we could have some drizzle and even some fog around early on Friday and then another chance for just some isolated showers as we get into Sunday. So we'll see the changes in the form of rain chances also for our temperatures. So look how warm we are today. Upper 70s, low 80s. It'll still be in the 70s Thursday into Friday, but as we get into the weekend, we'll see more of a cool down. High temperatures limited to the 60s on Saturday, potentially limited to the 50s by the end of the weekend on Sunday, so it won't be staying this warm um, through the weekend. That is for sure. Future cast very quiet the rest of the day. Tomorrow morning skies will still be clear. Fairly cool to start tomorrow, mid 40s, so a light jacket or sweater is in order tomorrow. But just like today, we'll warm into the mid to upper 70s tomorrow afternoon, and I think you'll start to notice an increase in clouds by tomorrow afternoon as well. But it will be tomorrow night and then into early Friday that we'll have a lot more cloud cover around, potentially some drizzle, patchy fog, and isolated showers to start the day on Friday. So tomorrow, another pretty quiet weather day for us. It'll be Friday that you'll start to notice some changes. As for your Wednesday, 81 this afternoon, south southwest wind. 5 to 10, but getting cool pretty quickly uh, this evening will fall into the 50s. Starting off in the 40s tomorrow morning, 76 your high on Thursday and then Friday. That's when we'll start to see our first round of changes, more humidity and some chances of isolated showers break in the rain on Saturday, but a few more showers possible by Sunday. Guys, doesn't look like December, but it's Texas. Thank you. Doesn't look like the Cowboys we've known and loved over the years either. What do they say? No D in Dallas? No D in Dallas. Yeah, some people are calling them Alice yeah. because there's no <laughs> D in Dallas. Yeah, the uh, Ravens just dominated the Cowboys last night, specifically on the ground. Lamar Jackson had a big contest. And John Harbaugh describes the Dez situation coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Lawford. Baltimore quarterback Lamar Jackson is back after missing the team's last game due to COVID-19. His return was bad for the Cowboys. First quarter, fourth and two Ravens, and Jackson breaks off a 37-yard touchdown run untouched, and the Ravens take the lead 7-3, part of his 94 yards on the ground. Now, ensuing possession for the boys, they answer right back. Andy Dalton and Michael Gallup for a 13-yard TD, and Dallas goes on top 10-7, but that lead was short-lived. On Dallas' next possession, Dalton's pass is tipped at the line. It's intercepted by the Ravens' Patrick Queen. The birds turn that into points immediately. Next snap, Jackson play action, then finds a wide-open Miles Boykin, and he goes in for a 38-yard touchdown and the lead for good, 14-10. The Ravens take it 34-17, roughing up the boys' defense for 294 rushing yards. Obviously a different challenge than we've seen. This is, this is a unique offense. Um, you know, obviously a, a very physical, uh, just the offensive line, and you know, just the dynamics of, you know, the, the, the you know, the combination of the running backs and, and, and Lamar. So, 300 yards is, is obviously astronomical. Uh, but you know, we have to we have to get a quick turnaround. Uh, you know, just when you. You know, you feel like you're taking some steps as a team. Uh, you know, the, the you know the keys to the game were was was stopping a run, and we we definitely didn't get that done tonight. They had trouble stopping the pass as well. Ravens receiver Marquise Brown hauled in the sweet over-the-shoulder touchdown in the third quarter, beating Rashard Robinson. The 3-9 and nine Cowboys will play at the Bengals Sunday at noon. Now, Ravens wide receiver Des Bryant gave us an X during pregame warm-ups. He was all excited to face his former team, but he tested positive for COVID-19 just 30 minutes before the game, and his night was over because he was ruled out of the contest. Des tweeted he's going to quit for the rest of the season because he can't deal with this. Then he later tweeted, yeah, I'm coming back. I'm being smart. Here's Ravens head coach John Harbaugh. 
No, I mean, the timing of this thing is it's a crazy kind of a deal, but we'd already turned in our inactives, and, uh, and then we were informed. Eric came down and told me that um, Des had a, uh, an inconclusive test, and they were retesting uh, one, of the, one of the quick tests they have, the MESA test. And we had to wait on that. And uh, in the meantime, the league told us we would not be allowed to bring a different player up if he, if he tested positive. But if he tested positive, that he wasn't going to be allowed to play. My understanding that they did all the contact tracing, all the procedures were followed as far as any other player is concerned. But then they came back out while we were on the field in pregame warm-ups and said that uh, he had tested positive and so he would not be allowed to play. According to reports, a Ravens employee tweeted a picture of Dez hugging members of the Cowboys before the game. That tweet has been deleted. Now that interim head coach Romeo Cornell has had a chance to review game film, what is his opinion on the low snap to Deshaun Watson that resulted in a fumble and cost the Texans their win against the Colts? I think the difference was that it was to his left side instead of to his right side. If it had been to his right side, I think he would have been able to to handle it. But because it was to his left side, he had to go across his body. And it certainly made it more difficult to get. Back to Des, you got to wonder, the NFL has been doing such a great job or trying to do such a great job of taking care of these players. Mm -hmm. Why they even let him on the field to begin with with the inconclusive test, knowing they were going to retest him? And that's what people are asking today yeah. as well. Yep. All right. Thanks, Larry. You got it. President-elect Joe Biden is outlining a three-step plan to begin tackling the coronavirus pandemic during the first 100 days of being in office. How he plans to do it, coming up next. Plus, YouTube releasing the top videos of the year. Why analysts say users searched content that met their very specific personal needs. And do you have credit card debt? Starting next year, creditors can contact you in more ways than one, including on your social media. Coming up today at 5, 12 on your side, Marilyn Moritz with the new tactics creditors are using to get you to pay up and why you should be cautious before you hand over the cash. President-elect Joe Biden's goal of getting 100 million people vaccinated is one of three steps he laid out for the first 100 days of his administration's COVID-19 response. ABC's Mary Bruce has the latest. President-elect Joe Biden is now outlining a three-step plan to begin tackling the coronavirus pandemic during the first 100 days that he is in office. He's going to be urging all Americans to wear a mask and says that on his first day in office, he'll be signing an executive order requiring them in the areas where he can. So on federal lands and on planes, trains and buses in between states. And when it comes to vaccines, they are promising to deliver 100 million shots in 100 days, vaccinating 50 million Americans. On schools, he is vowing to get the majority of them reopened. Now Biden is setting expectations. He's very blunt and realistic about the long road ahead and the many challenges that they are facing here, but he is convinced that they can begin to change the course of this virus in those first few months. Biden did make this announcement while unveiling his health team, and this morning we've learned of a few more names for his cabinet. He's asking Ohio Representative Marsha Fudge to be his housing secretary and is asking former Iowa Governor Tom Vilsack to reprise his role as the Secretary of Agriculture. Mary Bruce, ABC News, Washington. Meantime, the House of Representatives is set to vote today on a stopgap funding bill to avert a government shutdown at the end of the week. A short-term bill would provide more time for negotiations on broad legislation for government funding and pandemic relief. The bill, known as a continuing resolution, will keep the government funded for just one extra week. It extends the shutdown deadline from this Friday to December 18th. Live look outside. Check it out, 77 wow. degrees, beautiful day out there. It's snowing in the KSAT uh, parking lot, <laughs> I'm told. <laughs> yes, it despite is. Despite all that. Yeah. A uh, little Christmas it, party going on. Despite it being 77, that would be truly the cherry on top of 2020 if it were snowing outside. We've got a little, uh, little cheer happening here at KSAT, a nice snow machine out in the parking lot. <laughs> David difference. and I also made our own snow this morning on the news yeah. at nine for Katie Science Lab, so you can find that on uh, KSAT.com if you'd like to try that at home. Wouldn't bank on a white Christmas this year, that's for sure. Outside now, it's beautiful, plenty of blue skies, and if you haven't been out since early this morning, you may be surprised that it is not really cool out there anymore. We've got temperatures in the mid to upper 70s across most of Bear County. Stinson is sitting at 72, uh, 76 up in Kerrville, 78 in Pleasanton, and 78 in Castroville, so our air is heating up quickly this afternoon, and after school today, when all is said and done, a lot of us will see temperatures in the low 80s, so a very warm day. Southwest winds 
winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. The good news is here humidity is low and we'll keep sunshine around for the rest of the day. Tomorrow looks like a pleasant day as well, but again tomorrow afternoon it will be warm with highs in the mid to upper 70s. Another fairly warm day on Friday, but we'll actually see chances of showers kick in on Friday and then look what happens this weekend. Nice drop in our temperature 60s Saturday upper 50s on Sunday, so some changes are on the horizon. We'll talk more about what you can expect over the next few days coming up in the full forecast guys. Thank you, Katie. It is one of the best ways to slow the spread of COVID-19, but wearing a mask can also cause your skin to break out. CNN's Mandy Gaither has five ways to help keep your face clear. Having trouble keeping your skin clear beneath a mask? You're not alone. There's even a name for it on dictionary.com. Maskne is defined as acne or other skin irritations that result from wearing a mask. They perspire or if they're a little bit oily, the pores get clogged under the mask. And honestly, some people get irritated from the mask alone. Dr. Glenn Kalansky, board certified dermatologist and fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology says these five things can help. First, wash your face before and after putting on a mask and use an oil-free water-based moisturizer, but not too much. Many people put a thick layer on and when you put a thick layer, it can lead to clogging of the pores, especially under a mask. So it's just putting on a thin layer works fine. Change your mask often and keep it clean. If it's cotton, wash it frequently and watch what you're putting on your face. Most importantly is stop wearing makeup under the mask. Uh, it clogs the pores under the mask. I mean, and plus it keeps rubbing off on your mask and you just keep putting that mask on your face with old makeup. Finally, if you have to wear a mask for hours at a time, go to a place where you can take it off for five or 10 minutes to allow your skin some time to breathe. For today's Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Google releasing its most searched list in 2020. We're gonna take a look at the year's top trending searches. Jefferson and Southside getting ready for a playoff matchup. Larry Ramirez with a preview coming up in sports. Krispy Kreme is giving away donuts Ooh. to donut lovers for a reason to celebrate how you can score a dozen donuts for just a buck. Hello, everyone. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. Apple cracking down on apps that collect user data. The tech giant will start requiring developers to be more transparent with users about their data collection practices, all through an anti-tracking measure. The new policy will require apps to blatantly ask for users' permission before they can track their location. Meanwhile, Jack Dorsey is stepping up to make a big difference for thousands of Americans who are struggling amid the pandemic. The Twitter CEO donating $15 million to an organization called Mayors for a Guaranteed Income this is going to provide residents of participating cities with a promised monthly income, all to help get them back on their feet. Each city will be given up to $500,000, and the mayor of those respective cities can choose to delegate the money as they please. And if you're looking for just another reason to love Krispy Kreme, well, listen up. The donut chain officially bringing back their Day of the Dozens deal this Saturday, December the 12th, or 1212, obviously a play on the date. Donut lovers who buy a dozen glazed donuts can get another dozen for just one dollar. And the Chichetter Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado, coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. Angela Merkel has topped Forbes's most powerful women's list again. That's the German Chancellor's 10th consecutive year in the first spot. Merkel is set to retire from politics in 2021, but this year she was widely praised for how she handled the coronavirus in Germany. European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde was placed in second on the list. Rounding out the top three, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Harris is not only the first woman ever elected as Vice President of the United States, she's also the first woman of color and the first Asian American elected to that office. Google released its annual year in search list. It features the year's top trending searches. Google says global queries included the word why, such as why is toilet paper sold out? Still asking that question today. Or search more than the year before. Election results, coronavirus, top the US trending search list. Searches for Zoom, Naya Rivera, 
Chadwick Boseman and PlayStation 5 were also among the top 10. The list also highlighted some of the year's prominent losses. It included Eddie Van Halen, Kobe Bryant, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and George Floyd. Meantime, personal stories, breakup vlogs, lighthearted comedy, and inspirational news items were among the top videos trending on YouTube this year. Some of the top videos on YouTube include a stand-up special from Dave Chappelle examining police brutality and racial injustice, and Ricky Gervais's monologue from the 2020 Golden Globe Awards. Who could forget that? Makeup guru and lifestyle vlogger, uh, Nikki Tutorials also made headlines with her coming out video revealing that she's transgender. Maddie Buxton, culture and trends manager at YouTube, says they saw audiences coming to YouTube in search of content that meant very specific personal needs. This year's list really shows the ways that creators innovated under extremely challenging circumstances, whether that was finding sources of levity and entertainment or connection through social gaming or content that reflected their emotions and, and really continued conversations that were taking place around them in the world at large. Other top videos featured pandemic specific content such as Dude Perfect's quarantine stereotypes and actor John Krasinski's Good News Network, which highlighted positive and inspiring stories from all around the world. A new channel will cater to fans of the show The Price is Right, specifically Bob Barca era game shows, is getting its own TV channel. Free Mantle teamed up with Pluto TV to launch the new channel on streaming service Pluto TV. The channel will run 24-7. Barker hosted The Price is Right for more than three decades, from 1972 to 2007. And you know why that's going to be interesting? Because I can remember back when Bob Barker's cars were listed at, like, <laughs> I remember when it was a big deal, they went up to $4,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wouldn't that be It's going to be fun watching <laughs> those prices. <laughs> a little trip down memory. A Pinto. Remember that? I mean, you go, it's going to be you know fun what to a watch. Pinto? Yes, I know what a pencil is. Okay, was. just checking. Jeez, David. <laughs> okay. oh, no. That'll be nice to just like, you can just put that on and just like let it let it run. And it's, yeah. it's a happy show, right? Yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, the aquifer is down eight tenths of a foot to 660.4 and another quiet pollen count. We'll take them while we can get them right. This mold today and it's low with a count of 240. We do have some weather changes on the way the next few days. I'll let you know what to expect coming up. So one day we're chopping wood, putting it in a fireplace. The next day we're turning on the AC. Exactly. Such trying is, to find the flip flop skin. Yeah, such is life in Texas, right? <laughs> Got to be prepared for anything, especially this time of year. At least summer, we know it's just going to stay hot. This time of year, never know. Today was a perfect case of that. We started off at 41. We're up to 77 already. We could see a high temperature approaching our record for today's date. The record high is 85, set back in 2008. We're not going to go quite that warm today, but how about 81? That's close enough. Plenty of sunshine the rest of the day. South southwest winds 5 to 10. So while it will be unseasonably warm for this time of year, the short sleeves will do you just fine this afternoon. It won't be too uncomfortable. Our air is nice and dry, so that's helping to keep humidity low. Look at that dew point. 50 degrees spread between our air temperature and our dew point. That means things are very, very dry out there. South southwest winds at 8 at this hour. And again, plenty of sunshine. That'll continue for the rest of the day. Up to 78 already in Pleasanton. 70 in Del Rio. 72 up in Rock Springs. So uh, nice and warm out there. Winds are light. They'll be about 5 to 10 miles per hour at most this afternoon and this evening. Evening. And again, here are our very, very low dew points. Kerrville, that might be a little too low. I don't know that you're down to 11. That sensor always kind of undercuts things just a little bit. But bottom line, the air is very dry today and it'll stay dry through most of the day tomorrow. So here's 7 a.m. We've still got dew points 20s and 30s. So we'll start off air temperature wise in the 40s in the morning. So it'll be another pretty chilly start to the day tomorrow. But look what happens by tomorrow afternoon. We start to see our dew point numbers really climb. So by tomorrow evening, we'll start to see our dew points climbing out of pleasant territory and into muggy range. And that will be true through much of the day on Friday. So after a very comfortable day today and for most of the day tomorrow, it will turn humid on Friday. Friday is also when we could have some fog drizzle and chances of isolated showers around. But keep your eye focused off to the west there, west 
of 35 dry air moves in again late Friday night for Saturday. So long story short, humid day on Friday, but things will turn more pleasant and late fall like again by the start of the weekend on Saturday. I mentioned we will carry a chance of some isolated showers on Friday, some morning fog and drizzle possible as well. Saturday overall a really nice day. It will be a touch cooler high temperatures in the mid to upper 60s with low humidity. And then on Sunday we bring back another chance of rain. We'll have a second frontal boundary sneak through on Sunday that will help to keep us limited to the upper 50s in the afternoon and bring us another chance chance of some isolated showers. And I do want to kind of walk you through this on future cast and I'll let you know what we're expecting as far as these isolated showers go. So again, through the day tomorrow, things will be staying pretty quiet, but off in far west Texas, some activity starting to sneak in there. Thursday night through Friday morning, we'll see an increase in cloud cover. Some isolated showers possible on Friday, mainly first part of the day. Could be a couple of stronger storms, but that'll be north and east of us as we get into Friday afternoon and evening. This is the frontal boundary that comes through late Friday night and sets us up for a big drop in humidity on Saturday. So a little back and forth here, especially as we get into the weekend because of these two frontal boundaries. But this will be a little bit cooler by early next week, upper 50s and low 60s. We'll be right back. Spurs continue training camp. Draft picks Devin Vassell and Trey Jones are busy learning the Spurs culture and terminology. With everything delayed due to the pandemic, there hasn't been a lot of time to prepare them for their first professional season. So what advice have the veteran players such as DeMar DeRozan and Rudy Gay been able to give Vassell early on? Don't put too much pressure on yourself. I mean, right now we're in a unique situation. Um, you know, we had a week and a half, or about a week and a half until our first preseason game. Um, so really just come in each day, have fun, um, and just learn and get better each day. With at least four players down with injuries or recovering from offseason surgery, Vassell could see playing time this Saturday against OKC at 6 in the AT&T Center. Texas A&M postponed their game against Ole Miss for the second time due to COVID-19 and quarantines within the Ole Miss football program. The game was originally scheduled for last month, but the Aggies were forced to postpone it when two players tested positive on the road trip to South Carolina. If the game can't be rescheduled, and it probably won't, this robs seniors of their final game at Kyle Field, including Kellen Mond. The Reagan Rattler is set to graduate this week with hopefully one regular season game left on the schedule at Tennessee on the 19th. It's been a wild ride um, with a lot of ups and downs and, um, you know, just, you know, thankful for the people that I've had around me um, to keep me even keel, um, level headed through um, the highs and the lows. Um, but I mean, I'm definitely thankful for, um, you know, everything that, uh, you know, that has been thrown at me and, you know, that I've been able to adjust to and uh, continue to persevere on. The Aggies are seven and one and ranked fifth in the nation. One of the big games in our big game playoff coverage Friday night will feature the Jefferson Mustangs against the Southside Cardinals. The Mustangs made the postseason after holding off Memorial 14-9 to finish their pandemic-shortened season at 2-3. While the Southside Cardinals are number one in District 14 5A Division I with an 8-1 overall record with one forfeit of their own. But the Cardinals have not played in the last two weeks due to other teams canceling games. Uh, we just practice against each other, you know, give each other looks, make sure we're getting reps, stay in game shape, condition all the time, work out, lift. Gave a lot of us time to get healthy again and uh, come back to our usual bodies and, you know, back to where we, where we were in the beginning. They might be a little rusty, but we never know. We don't know what they're capable of, but we're just going to go out there and play ball. It's been a while since the Jefferson community and football team's been in the playoff so this is a big thing you know especially given that we've started what September October um, way later than the season we didn't think we'd be going this long just because of the circumstances but uh, it's a blessing we've been able to go this long kickoff at South Side on Friday night is set for 7 30 p.m. It's Greg Simmons walking around the sports bar a little giddy he is yeah thing. yeah Jeff alum he's definitely very happy about it <laughs> kind of proud <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, Fiona was by herself yesterday, but apparently there wasn't enough food around, so she had to bring in David Elder to help her out, right? <laughs> yeah. That's right. This that's, is what we do. If, yeah. If there's, a, if, there's cookies in front of us. That's why I'm here. That's uh -huh. how they, they lured me in with a cookie trail from my house to come here. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, yes, but listen up because today is day five, of course, of our 12 days giveaway. That means whoever wins today's prize walks away with day one, two, three, and four prizes as well. So That's stick right. around for that. That's a lot of prizes. Oh, yeah. Which is incredible. You got to watch to see what you're going to be winning today. Now, we also have a lot of cool tips right here is from Bird Bakery. We're going to be teaching you guys how to like, set up the little kits that they have, but a cool tip right now that we can share with you is how to make your cookies taste better, and that is to use butter, because butter is better. You don't want to use the margarine stuff. You don't want to use, I mean, have bacon fat used before on cookies. We're pretty good. But if you want to get those really rich cookies, you want to get all that flavor, you have to use butter. And what I didn't know is chill your dough one to two hours before you roll it out. That can help I didn't, yeah. your cookies. That's such a pro taste tip. Better. That is such a professional tip. <laughs> like, that sounds I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> I ain't got time for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's right. And then we also have Joyride on the show today. They're going to be talking about their Toy Ride event that's coming up where you can work out, give back this weekend. And we will have more details on how you can get involved coming up in a little bit. And how about those fabulous poinsettias that help things feel so festive. Flowers by V is going to show us how you can make your very own at home. And I'm going to show you my favorite things. These are things that I have that are great gift ideas that I've given to people and that I have at home and you are going to enjoy them. Can't wait. <laughs>